I'm Stephen Foskett, the organizer of Tech Field Day. We are here in San Francisco for Intel Cloud Day. Intel made some product and technology announcements this morning, and we've got a group of independent uh, experts uh, to talk about the cloud implications of what Intel announced today. So let's go around the table and uh, introduce ourselves, and then we'll kick off the discussion. I'll start. I'm, I'm James Green. I'm an author, uh, speaker, and a partner in a company called Actual Tech Media. Uh, my name is Eric Wright. Uh, you can usually find me um, at Disco Posse on Twitter. I'm a technology evangelist for VM Turbo and a podcaster at GCOnDemand.io. Hi, I'm Mark Teeley, a uh, technology executive, and uh, you can find me on Twitter at mteeley10. And uh, most of my blogs uh, for the, uh, recently have been on my LinkedIn profile. I'm Tim Crawford. Um, I advise CIOs and other enterprise uh, organizations through Avoa. And you can find me on Twitter at T. Crawford or follow my blog at avoa.com. Ahmad Yunus. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at uh, Ahmad underscore Yunus or my blog, ahmadyunus.com. And I'm Alistair Cook. You can find me online as DemiTasNZ, because I come from New Zealand, and DemiTas.co.nz. And since James didn't mention it, his Twitter handle is at JD Green. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Always looking out for each other. Yes. Is that the nature of the cloud? It is. I don't think so. No. Um, <laughs> so uh, one, of the, one of the points that came up uh, after some of this morning's presentations and discussions is um, sort of a core question. We're here with Intel. And as uh, we, many people know, uh, Intel makes um, a lot of components, but is not necessarily um, a familiar brand in terms of people going shopping for their products. Um, so uh, I guess to start the discussion, who is the customer that Intel is trying to reach? Who is the customer that's supposed to be excited by these product announcements and these technologies? And, um, and, and what are they buying? So I I think one of the components that, that we have to probably differentiate when it comes to Intel is who's buying the components directly and also who is Intel supporting. So one of the things we heard this morning um, had to do with some of the work that they're doing in terms of contributing software and contributing code. And, and Intel's obviously a huge software company. So forget about the components. They're building a lot of software that they're contributing to customers and prospects that might not be direct customers, but might be secondary or tertiary customers. So there's one value chain that comes from that, but then there's also the value chain that comes from the, comp the core components themselves. I would say that historically, it's, it seemed that you know, Intel puts those into products that get into the supply chain, that get to end products for enterprises and end users directly. But that's starting to shift, from my opinion, to ISVs and service providers. So if you follow the workload, you follow the components. Yeah, there's certainly been far more Intel servers shipped into cloud providers and into these hyperscale data centers in the last few years than there have been. There's been that inflection point where more are being shipped to the, the, the hyperscalers than to on-premises data centers. I think Intel's customers are changing. But the end consumer of the services remains the same. That those data centers are servicing demands that were previously on premises uh, within organizations. Now, because those same organizations, customers are, are internet connected and mobile, there's an, a natural tendency for the, the applications to move to the cloud providers, to the hyperscale data centers. But the end consumer remains the same. It's just that who buys from Intel might be changing a little. What's interesting, I find, is that I think it's the model that they're shipping. You know, like, what's the actual product that they're sending? Now they're effectively sending the full stack. You have already own the hardware. They're going to send you updated hardware, which has additional capabilities that have been exposed now to this software layer. And that's where that SDI layer, you know, stack comes in. And I think that's where they're trying to bring on the enterprises that weren't quite ready for the public cloud ISV adoption necessarily. They still want to keep it inside the fences. But... You know, it keeps the happy Intel customers that are already there, and it just it pushes that capability for hardware right up to the application layers. Yeah, I mean, it, it would seem that um, you know their efforts around the ecosystem, their efforts around OpenStack, uh, et cetera, um, are as much about ensuring there's a viable market for private cloud and for hybrid cloud environments, but um, also for their 
the focus again, you know, the, it's it's easy to think of Intel. You mentioned software, Tim. It's easy to think of Intel as a component company. They're selling chips and they're selling networking and things like that. But um, what they're also selling today is the 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 wrapper that helps people actually grow the cloud environment, right? Whether it's uh, performance management or whether it's making the network faster or whether it's allowing you to use your chipsets more effectively, whether it's uh, making sure that OpenStack is more easily used and installed, whatever it is, they're trying to make that whole environment better as opposed to just saying, here's more chips, here's more memory, go have fun. Here's a way to keep using that. You know, it's the, right. it, it's, not the, you never want to say it's like, here, the first one's on me, right? That idea of like, let's give you a tool and let's give you more ways that you need to use that tool that you then grow. Because people are less dependent on the chip than they are on the stack. If they become latched onto the stack, then the chip that enables the stack to its best of its capability suddenly becomes far more important. And that's the way to sell it, further up, right? Yeah, and there's another piece, if you'll pardon me putting my very cynical hat on, uh, the amount of money that a company has to spend on their IT infrastructure is fairly fixed. So if the, the reason uh, Intel is pushing into the OpenStack very strongly and getting that quick time to deploy of OpenStack is so that you can spend more of that money on the hardware that Intel makes and less of it on the software that somebody else makes. It's rather a cynical view, but I think it is very much a, a part of what they're talking about. They're talking about reducing the cost to deploy the infrastructure, making it quicker and simpler, and because you've made a resource more available, then consumption of that resource will, will go up. It's good for Intel, it's good for their customers, might not be good for other people who have made expensive software that enabled the same functionality. <laughs> yeah, I don't think that's a cynical view at all, really. I mean, that's what Intel does. Intel drives um, many, uh, much of their development effort outside of CPUs is driving increased usage of CPUs, uh, increased usage of I.O. bandwidth, increased usage of storage. They are absolutely trying to build, you know, on that, the whole compute stack. And the more they build on the compute stack, the more it helps them. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the competition between um, a CIO trying to say that they offer an, even um, a major portion of the services that would come natural with a service like uh, the Azure stack or through Amazon or whatever means that in order for private cloud to continue to be competitive, it has to be much more easily consumed than it has been historically. And it seems like that's certainly one of the themes of of what Intel's trying to get across here is making that, making private cloud a little bit more push button than it has been historically. Mm -hmm. I think well, that was one of the most exciting things out of today was their objective to say you should be able to stand up a private cloud in a day, not three months. Right. And you shouldn't need to employ 20 consultants to do it. Right. I mean, arguably, aside from the technology itself, you, you have to look at the buying pattern, how the buying pattern has changed for the customer. I mean, the executive is not interested in having 50 million uh, providers in their shop, they're actually looking to consolidate that a bit. And we see that with cloud, right? The, the successful ones are really kind of based on not pricing, but more so on the ecosystem and the broader context of what they bring to the table. And I think that's something that, that I see Intel kind of contributing to is it's not just about selling components, it's about how do we make sure that the ecosystem that we play in is exceptionally vibrant and, um, and healthy. And that was uh, one of the things that I did this morning uh, is I spent some time interviewing uh, folks from the main um, hardware vendors that Intel is feeding these new devices to. So I talked to Cisco, HP, Dell, and Lenovo. Uh, and in each case, uh, what they said that they were intending to do with these new products is essentially what you've just said, which is allow customers to stand up a complete turnkey private cloud in fill in short number here, you right, know, right. where that number is as little as three hours, you know, which right. is what I heard. And they, from they don't have any choice, right? I mean, they really don't have any choice if they want to continue to be viable in the market where people are. I mean, I mean the, the anecdote in the industry, of course, is I can use my credit card and I can be using it in 10 minutes. And if the, if the consumer can't get that like whether it's consumer products or whatever it is, if they can't get that as a consumer from their IT organization, then they're gonna go somewhere else to find it. And that's the only way to stay competitive is to be, enable that capability. The part that's missing is that, you know, we, uh, 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 clouds stood up in three hours or one day, 
is like saying, well, I've put a Ferrari engine in the garage. How do I drive to work? Right? What we, what we haven't seen today um, is, is the rest of the car. How do, we, how do we control that? How do we control the gas to it? How do we control the organization that supports it? How do we control the security around it? All those other things that make the cloud much more than a stack of hardware that's tightly integrated and you can do commands on. I mean, arguably, just the term the cloud at yep. this point is getting so nebulous right. that it's, right. it's really Cloudy. irrelevant. Yeah. Yeah. It's, no, it's, it's funny because in a recent discussion I was in with a couple of CIOs, we had this very issue, which is, the cloud as a term is so nebulous, it's irrelevant. What's relevant is what it can do for me. So just because I have the Ferrari engine, big deal. Right. It's sitting right. in a garage. Great. My friends can come look at it. What's that do for me as a business, as a company? What's it going to allow me to do that I couldn't do before? What's it going to free up that I can then put those resources in a different direction? Right. And so executives that I work with, that's what they're looking for. They're looking for that differentiation. It, this isn't just about flipping bits or one technology for the other. It's about business advantage and customer engagement. On the technology itself, though, what's interesting, and there was an article, I think, yesterday or two days ago from Matt Assay, and he talked about the success of any new, especially open platform, is around defining a standard for it. And there's 400 you know, products that are JS frameworks, which is why there's 400. There should be 10, and three of them should be the top. But we have 400, and no one knows who's winning. OpenStack has been a challenge because, you know, they felt it got fragmented. And now it's come back to the core a little bit more. We saw open container initiative. We saw open networking. Everything that's been talked about today already has a foundation, a framework of standardization wrapped around it. And that's cool, right? Like, I think that that's going to be helpful in bringing all of these other pieces. You know, like you said, you still have to deliver business solutions. So it's the end result. I don't care what the technology is. Right. Yeah. But you also have to do it in a way that's going to be supportable, repeatable, and it's going to have a longer life cycle. Right. Maybe this is something that you would have a good thought on, Tim, but um, I think being able to go from zero to cloud in three hours or a day or whatever is pretty good. <laughs> but whether it's a day or two days or whatever, that's way better than three months. But what about the organization that still doesn't have any idea of how to use a public cloud and like the, right. the way they do their development and run their business is not conducive to having a, a cloud. Like, I guess my question is what else needs to change or um, how do they go from where they are to there even though they're now enabled to get there fast? Well, and Mark talked a little bit about this. It's, it's not just about the technology, it's about the process, it's about the people. It's about the people not just in the IT organization, but the people outside. What do they expect of IT? I mean, right now, their expectation generally is IT is where big projects go to die. I mean, these, these are real conversations that are yeah. happening. I'm not exaggerating. Um, and it's sad, but that's part of the evolution that needs to happen. I talk about this in the context of the three-legged race. There are three components, just like if you were to go to a picnic and you do the, the three-legged race, all three kind of have to generally move together uh, in sync. And the three pieces are the IT organization, the CIO, and the rest of the company. And those three all have to evolve and transform together. So the bigger issue is actually a people and process issue than it is a technology right. issue. But there are multiple components, as you alluded to. There are absolutely multiple I mean, components to that. Yeah, and I obviously couldn't agree more. Um, most IT organizations today, the reality is, is that with the exception of the people that are going out to Amazon because they want to test something that IT never approved, they've worked to get a project approved. They've gone out and started doing um, a, a process documentation and requirements in the, in the audience with their champion from the consumer group whether it's the customer in the, in the enterprise. And by the time they're done with that, I could have bought hardware and had it installed in the data center four different times the old traditional way. So that speed is important, but it's not the answer, right? It's important once you have a mega scale application in place, which is only 5% of the apps in any enterprise, and you want to be able to add capacity to it in your own private environment, assuming you're not trying to do it in a hybrid or a burst type of capacity, which is still fairly unusual. Um, generally speaking, though, it's about being able to say that I can 
create a storefront for my customers to get access to capacity in more real time. Now, but again, back to the, your question and, and Tim's answer, is that if you have a waterfall approach to enabling capacity, who cares if you can spin up, I, I got you your compute. Well, okay, who do I go talk to about storage? Who do I talk to about enabling the network? Who do I talk to about ensuring that security policy is applied properly to whatever it is I'm working on, right? Does that engine that was just installed in three hours or a day solve that for me? I, I actually think it's more fundamental than that. It, and the analogy I would use is one that comes up in security spaces, which is, you know, we put security, within the IT organization, you know, when you're responsible for an IT organization, you're always thinking about risk. And how do I protect the organization as a whole? We put security policies in place and tell users, do this, don't do that, and whatnot. But we still see examples where they might take that confidential document and send it to their personal email account so they can access it at home for whatever reason. The VPN's down, it's, something is slow, something doesn't work, can't get to, to a particular application. It doesn't matter what the reason is. What's the fundamental reason why the user does that? Is it because they're trying to be malicious, trying to put the company at risk? It has nothing to do with that. At the end of the day, the individual is just trying to do their job. They're trying to do right by the company and do their job. Now, they may not know any better, but at the end of the day, they're not intentionally trying to put the company at risk. They're just trying to do their job. And when we bring that analogy in that, or that example, it's not really an analogy, but bring that example back to cloud, it's kind of the same thing. Spinning it up or going off and getting public cloud services from another provider, I'm not doing that because I'm trying to harm the company. It's because I just need to get something done. And I need to find the best way to do that, the easiest way to do that. Or you believe you have found the best way to do that. That's, I think, another um, issue of, um, of education that IT can engage in and, and collaboration, really, that IT can engage in. And that is that, in many cases, these folks um, aren't aware of any other option. You know, I mean, why do people use Dropbox at, home, at, at, at work un, unauthorized? Because they like it. Maybe there's an option. Maybe there's an option that IT could provide, but um, but they don't know about that. They just want to use Dropbox. You know, why would somebody set up their own private email server or whatever? Because they want to use their iPhone. Or, I mean, it's 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 not that they've weighed all the consequences. They just found that this is a good solution. I want to use that one. But do you think because we have these tools instant now, right? Because mm -hmm. we live in a world where I want it now, 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 right? And I'll get it any way I can. Do you think that's actually ruined the relationship between the consumer and IT? Because IT now isn't as fast and will not give me that now, now, now service? I don't, I don't know if it's ruined it. I think it's just made it more obvious for the outside market because there isn't, there isn't the assumption anymore in the consumer that this is how it has to be. Right? Historically, the assumption was if IT told me it was going to take a year to do this, then I might as well go back and start knitting and wait for a year because that's how long it takes. Mm -hmm. But um, it's not so obvious anymore. In fact, it's much more obvious because we use consumer tech so much more than we did even 10 years ago that I don't understand. I can go to the store, I can buy this, I can be doing that, and I can be doing this, and I can be doing all that by the end of the night. Why does it take me three months to get that package of stuff from my IT department, right? Well, the skill sets, right? I mean. It, today they were talking about automation and, and making sure, like you were saying, you know, provisioning cloud in, in less than a day, right? There's a big gap in skill sets, right? And if you don't have those skill sets, then how, how is IT expected to deliver, you know, that instant gratification? Well, and, and I think, so, yeah, there's a lot of ways to answer that question, I'm afraid. Um, the first one, of course, is it has to, be, going back to the organization again, it has to be an organizational decision starting with the CIO, about what kind of IT group they want to have for that business. And the business has to buy off on that. Mm -hmm. If the business has decided that it makes sense for us to have a bunch of developers and wrenchers, then that may be the right group to say, yeah, let's continue to build on that skill set and let's offer those things internally. If the business has decided actively or inactively that they don't want that kind of IT organization, then they are de facto saying that what we are going to be is guides to help you buy the right stuff externally. Mm -hmm. Right. And the other, the other piece to, that kind of layers in there, I mean, at the end of the day, relationships play a very significant role. So to, right. to Stephen's comment earlier, I, the one thing that, that I was thinking about is 
there's a, there's a big assumption in that that the rest of the company actually trusts IT. And there is a phenomenal amount of distrust mm -hmm. of IT organizations. And quite frankly, we brought it on ourselves. There's I mean, distrust within the IT organization yeah. from there, silo to silo. Yeah. There exactly. absolutely is. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I have it's been a very stories. negative relationship. Right. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's an unhealthy relationship, right? And so that also plays a very significant role in getting us out of this hole and figuring out how we move forward. Now, there's a way to kind of sidestep some of this, but to Mark's point, and I, I couldn't agree more about this. Some, some time back, I thought, I, I was under the belief that transformation and change could happen as a grassroots effort, or it could happen with a very significant leader that had support. And now I'm of the mindset that the grassroots effort will never take off. It will never be successful. It requires the combination of the CIO to take lead on it. No one else. It has to be the CIO. The, the top person within the IT organization has to start the process. But they also have to have the respect, so again, going back to relationships, of their peer group, the rest of the C-suite, and the support to start changing this. And there shouldn't be the expectation that this is just going to turn over overnight. Mm -hmm. It's, I, it's yeah. not going to happen. What's interesting I mean, today is if the difference between you adopting private cloud and not adopting private cloud is the fact that you can get it in one day or in 22 days, your, that private cloud delivery is not the problem. It's the cultural right. shift, right? right? But what's interesting about what we talked about today and delivering it sub one day is that once you're culturally prepared you've gotten buy-in, you're ready to move forward, you're now at the start line. And that's what stuff like what was brought up today is interesting now to me and, you know, and what we to CIOs is that, okay, now that we're ready to adopt, what is the faster path to actually deploy? And I think that's what's, what I like about what I saw with the SDIX team and what they've done, you know, like, I don't necessarily think it's going to be like, ah, you know, we've, we've produced this Intel cloud, everyone's going to get it now. However, if you are, you know, like you said, Tim, if you've got the adoption at the top, you've got it across the C-suite, you've got the buy-in below, we've got all those layers, now what? Because there's still that now what uh, all over the place. Right. You know, we right. see it in, in every aspect, and private cloud is one of the toughest ones to sell as a concept, because once you say, all right, we're ready for private cloud, like, okay, what is it? So you, know, you said one thing in regards to, you know, picking the type of IT mm -hmm. that, that you want. And in some of the discussions today or in, um, as I'm listening, you know, I hear a lot about open source, right? And we're going to leverage the ecosystem, right? So it seems to me, you know, that, okay, I don't have it in-house, but I can go elsewhere, right? And I can get those skills or get that product and bring it in-house and then maybe try to develop it more towards or nurture it more towards my my needs do you i mean well i don't i don't think there's an all or nothing for the answer for you first of all but i think that if you had to pick one answer it would be that if you haven't decided you've got a wrencher and a developer type of community in it then open source that you download off of github is probably not the answer right Right. So I, I, if you had to just pick a blanket answer, that's not the answer. Because, uh, I mean, imagine, even today, right? even, even as much as we talk about the maturity of OpenStack today, even using the word maturity with OpenStack <laughs> is awkward. Yeah. But if you talk about it being mature today, who in their right mind, in an IT organization of you know, 10 people in infrastructure and 10 people in apps and all of them busy all day already with whatever else they do, saying, yeah, go download op uh, OpenStack and have it ready to run our environment in a couple of weeks. Unless you're like a Walmart that has, you know, this exactly. massive, right? Exactly. And that's what I'm talking about is, yeah. you know, we hear a lot about open source. We hear about this ecosystem, but no one ever says, okay, don't go download this product because it's not really going to, it's not going to fit your needs day one. You still need those developers. You still need those, you know, uh, admins to be able to help get it in place and then developers to help code right. it based on your needs or, or whatever. Even, uh, even defining your infrastructure and whether or not your infrastructure has the right components to be able to leverage OpenStack from the day you first get it and try to install it. I mean, those are things that are not, um, they're not, I mean, you, you look at some of the first projects where they had 40 or 50 people just working on OpenStack 
And it took them 18 months to get it to the point where they could say they were running in an operation. Now, it's matured since then. This is two and three years ago. But nonetheless, that's, it's, it is not downloading a distro of Linux. No. Right. Heck no. is, there's there's I mean, two, car- oh, sorry, go ahead, Tim. Uh, did, when we talk about that, it's, we t- see the partners that were highlighted today, and two of them stood out to me. One, of course, is Mirantis, because obviously they're a key leader yep. in, in that. And the other one is Rackspace. If you take a look at the model they've both delivered on, is very high touch, consulting, we build it for you, we coach you through it, using it. It's still a very high touch delivery, and it's, it's still got a long time to go to do that. And that stood out to me as like, while you're, we're gonna create this ability to consume private cloud, you, you're still going to need a lot of help, especially on OpenStack. And believe me, I'm the I'm the OpenStack kid. I've been pitching this thing for for years now, and and I'm still going to be pitching it in five years. I'm finally going to get to say hi. I told you so. But <laughs> you know, like like you said, that's there's still a very you still need a a partner, and that's where packaging it, you know, and partnering with somebody like a Marantis, you know, there's no secret to why they were the largest ever open source funding. You know, at a hundred million dollars in a single round in history, but, but because but, of that, yeah, they've got so, potential. Well, I think the, you know the first thing. The first thing you have to kind of get over the hump of is there's kind of this preconceived notion within IT organizations that open source equals free. Right. Right. And free open, is in puppy. Free is yeah. in yeah. puppy. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. exactly. Free is in a pool. Yeah. But yeah. Free is in a boat. Yeah. You know? What's What's the best time to have a boat? Yeah. The day you sell it. Right. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> the, Open source a little, or open source and OpenStack a little different. When you download OpenStack, what are you what are you dealing with? You have a bag of parts, mm-hmm. and that par- that bag of parts requires development activities. Mm-hmm. But OpenStack is really in the infrastructure space. The infrastructure space doesn't generally have developers, it has scripters, yep. has admins, not developers. So you've got a mismatch of skills right out of the gate. Right. Now, there are commercial offerings. That you can go with, and you can engage someone like a Rackspace or Mirantis into the mix. But if you don't have the scale, that's an incredibly expensive proposition to be able to spread that cost across what you're trying to do. And at that point, as an IT executive, I step in and go, why are we doing this? The return and the value here just absolutely does not exist. Now, the commercial offerings, like what Blue Box did with, with OpenStack, I think are, are very interesting. They've made it approachable. But then you still get into the, the argument of why are we doing OpenStack versus, you know, we've got VMware workloads. Where does it fit in? And I think there's still some rooting out that needs to happen to figure out where does it play well and where does it doesn't. And as a general purpose solution, I, that's where it has started from the conversation. It's kind of the, the end all be all for everyone. And I think now what we're seeing is it's not. Right. So let's figure out where it does play well, and let's focus on that. But right. the, the key thing for me from what Intel talked about today is let's take away that problem you just highlighted, <clears throat> that deploying OpenStack is a multi-month or multi-week expensive consultant-heavy activity. Their whole point is let's make it not. So how does that change how applicable OpenStack is? I still agree it's not going to be for everybody, but I think it vastly expands the uh, addressable market for OpenStack, to use those triple well, tips. I actually uh, don't agree. Well, I, th- I think it could. So, sorry, I cut right. here real quick. I think it could make the market more addressable, but it depends on, on what we're talking about from a delivery standpoint. If we're saying that you're buying a package stack, and as part of that, OpenStack has been defined to work for that stack of hardware that you buy, then that's great. Then I have... 900 racks in my data center and I just bought 10 racks and those 10 racks work great with OpenStack but the other 900 I got to figure out what to do with over the next 10 years. Now maybe it's 90 racks in one rack, maybe it's 10 racks in one rack, whatever it is, but the same problem applies. And getting, getting that OpenStack to be valuable at scale across the rest of your enterprise apps is the hard part. And so to Tim's point, you could, I mean, I love analogies, I mean you could put a jet engine on your Pinto and you could still drive it, <laughs> but does it make up. sense? Pretty, pretty awesome. But though. does it make <laughs> sense? Right. So what? What's the if if OpenStack is literally? I paid a hundred thousand dollars for this rack of servers, and OpenStack is a hundred dollars on top of it, or a thousand dollars on top of it. Then oh, it's like ESXi. Sure, just put it on there. That's fine. If I don't use it, so what? But if it's 
400 or $500 a node, then you've got to make some real serious business decisions about what's the value this is driving for something that my business is only ready to add the equivalent of a server or one new app a month or a quarter to. Does that really make sense? Now I've got to support this. Now I've got to worry about how it works with my hardware changes, my network changes, with whether I decide to go to SDN for the entire data center, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm only releasing a couple of things a week, right? So, And that's why I had the kind of visceral reaction to, to your comment was that I think you get over one hurdle. And so that's why when I heard Intel talk about that, fine. So it makes getting to private cloud on OpenStack one hurdle easier or, you know, get, get over that hurdle easier. But it doesn't address the other hurdles, which the hurdles of why would I use OpenStack in the first place? If the majority of my workloads are VM-based, VMware-based today, there's a refactoring, a reinstallation of those workloads, and there's a significant risk to do so. So, so there's a cost there, and then the value question comes up. Is there value in actually making that move? Right. And then let's say I do move to OpenStack, and I, I'm successful in doing that, or I have a new set of applications, which in the average enterprise is a very small piece of the overall work that gets done in an enterprise. But let's say I do start building out this OpenStack infrastructure. Now I'm ready to start leveraging a public cloud infrastructure. How do I start to leverage other solutions? And I think this is where you just, we don't do enough thought around strategy and thinking about things holistically of how this is going to play out. It's always, let's just look and figure out how to get to the next thing, right? Let's get to the next thing. Now, okay. basically. So, yeah. The now. So, yeah. so consider <laughs> what... Um, my fellow Southern Hemisphere gentleman from CBA, I've forgotten his name, from the Commonwealth Bank of Australia said, the transformation they've gone from is pre-virtualization to a full continuous integration, continuous deployment for, now we're going to assume, just for the systems of engagement, the things that are externally facing. Mm -hmm. That is that complete transition. It is. Yep. And a lot of organizations still have all of the, the active development is on those systems of engagement. And that's the thing that benefits from being cloudified. When we talk about bimodal IT, which I think we all agree is, is just, here's a cut point in, of how you think about it rather than a de defining architecture. The systems of record are still sitting there and being developed on the old um, uh, expensive hypervisor, heavily managed, non-cloudified, never going to be cloudified. You're never going to take your current big ERP system and turn it into a microservices architecture based on Docker containers that are running on who knows what platform. They're going to stay, stay as they are. So the requirement to integrate the infrastructure for the two types is, I don't think is so strong. I think the, the systems of, of interaction that, that are uh, engagement for, for clients are going to be built much more rapidly and on the sorts of uh, open source, open stack kind of platforms that we see, but the systems of, of record are going to remain on legacy architectures, and those are the things that are going to be the longest time living on premises, until of course you move them out to a colo, which is the majority of Rackspace's business. Yeah, right. Mark, Mark and I were talking about that last night. The inherent um, slowness or uh, uh, inertia of IT, right. and the right. fact that. Uh, it seems like people are looking for um, they're looking for a light switch that says cloud, but that's not going to happen. <laughs> you know, some things don't make sense to be cloudified, or at least not yet. Um, and frankly, you know, if the, if the history of open systems has shown us anything, it's the fact that systems tend to lag. You know, some systems tend to lag behind because they're either too important to move, too difficult to move or there's just no compelling reason to move them right now. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, there again, you know, back to your, your comment about, uh, as well about, you know, we've got a few racks of OpenStack, what about all these other racks? That's the reality for most companies, and it will be the reality for most yeah. companies. There is a, there is a shift that, that I do see that is happening, and that is, if you think about the progression, I've done a fair amount of writing about this, this progression that's actually taking place, but if you look at the the classic systems in IT and moving through the cloud progression, whether it's on-prem, off-prem, cloud, non-cloud, private cloud, public cloud, and you look at the, the progression, your workloads, and we used to call them applications, now we call them workloads, but they're, 
they're spread across all of these different modes at the same time, right? There'll be, there might be an emphasis on classic on-prem today and a little bit here and a little bit here and a little bit here. You can talk about moving them along this progression over time, but we'll never see that happen in any of our career lifetimes. We'll never see it completely take place. Mm -hmm. However, one thing that is starting to happen is this jump from the traditional implementation of the applications to a SaaS-based alternative. Mm -hmm. Because now you can essentially sidestep all of this and go to a very specific application. And it, even with the ERP applications, you get away from the general purpose, really heavy, highly customized applications that going through this progression would just be a nightmare. And that's putting it mildly. <laughs> going to a SaaS-based alternative the path that people are taking is not to another general purpose SaaS based ERP package, but rather an ERP package that is specialized for their industry. Might be a smaller provider and that's okay, but it's specialized for what they do and so therefore it becomes an easier transition. You do that, it makes this mountain of stuff start to fall apart in a good way uh, relatively quickly. Talking about all the cloud stuff, if Stephen, if you don't mind, I'd like to propose kind of um, taking a leap from where your question started with bringing in a rack with the OpenStack on it and going from there. Is you know one of the one of the things that um, I took away from this morning's presentations was that Intel was continuing to build the things, the services and the and the tools and the processors and, and the memory and the SSDs and things like that that will allow us to keep up with demands of change, right? Um, looking back at your question, starting with the, the idea, okay, we brought a rack in. If a company is looking at bringing a rack in with OpenStack on it, because they're saying that this is the genesis point, and to, to marry it to the point you were just making, Tim, that this is the genesis point for how we're going to build out going forward, that we need, it doesn't matter whether the cost per workload is incrementally higher in this first thing because we need more developers or we need more time to get it going. It's, it's what this platform means to us as we begin to address the things that many of us believe are gonna be impacting IT in a serious way over the next five years, right? Whether it's greater use of IoT, whether it's a bigger swing between, like today, if you looked at the average um, enterprise, less than 5% of the application workload in an enterprise is for external and 95 is internal. Less than 7% of the applications are any kinds of applications that require any kind of real scale versus ones that are well-trended and never go up more than 10 or 15% over the course of a month, right? What some of us believe, I'm, I'm one of them, um, is that those, both of those dynamics are gonna change seriously over the course of the next five years. That because of IoT, because of big data, because of machine learning, that not only are we gonna see a lot more apps focused on the external, but that we're gonna see a hot, because of that, we're also gonna see a much higher percentage of apps that require that kind of scale, distribution, and elasticity that haven't been required historically. So with that being a caveat, Intel at the basis level is getting better bearings, smoother oil, right. you know, uh, uh, better cylinders, bigger carburetors, all that stuff. <clears throat> is that important? Is that, is that where we should be going? Is that what we should be worrying about? Well, the, maybe the... the because analogies are our thing today. <laughs> While everybody's trying to target building a better mousetrap, they've not only tried to build a better mousetrap, the physical hardware in order to deliver the services, they're also selling you a cat. Yeah. So that just, <laughs> maybe you won't even need the mousetrap, maybe you'll get the best of both, right? That's right. take a you know, two-pronged approach to delivering a business solution. Right. Solve private cloud, solve latency through hardware. They're, they're, They've come up with two very interesting ways of attacking big problems that we've got. And like you said, elast I'm always, I always laugh when people say, talk about, I love the elasticity of cloud. The elasticity of private cloud is plus 10% year over year, period. It only ever goes one way. It's very gentle, 10, 20% year over year growth is traditional enterprise workloads, right? right. So, but yeah, I agreed that, that like five to 7% is gonna increase, you know, and we'll see more of that true elasticity, but, a lot of the traditional enterprise workloads, it's going to live in those, you know, what we call legacy. You know, hey, in five years, Docker's going to be legacy. It's going to be great when we can sit back and talk about that one. But 
it's that's so that's the way that I see. Is like I've, you know I like the fact that they've come at it from two directions. Said like we've you need hardware, you need the stack, have at it. You know and open the ecosystem so that if you think that you can help us to drive it better to meet your needs, then by goodness, mm -hmm. jump on into GitHub and, and make it happen. Yeah, this is a company that knows how to build and sell lots and lots of core components. Yeah, true. But I think there, so I agree with what you said, but I think there are two challenges in the general <clears throat> enterprise today. Number one, the traditional processes and even the organization that's in oh, place no doubt. is in no way, shape, or form prepared to be able to take that on. And definitely not at the pace in which it's coming at them. Right. So it's coming at them like a speeding truck, right? And they're going, okay, well, let's go to a training class. Let's learn this. Let's, you know what? They're going to get run over long before they figure out where they're going. The second piece is that the IT organization, from an IT leadership perspective, I want to up-level the conversation. I want to get out of the nuts and bolts of running things, running the machine. The machine, especially at scale, needs to be done by someone who can specialize in that. I think this is where the service providers and ISVs come into play and at scale because they can specialize on that. I, as an IT leader, my staff doesn't have to worry about that piece. They can up-level the conversation. They can focus on things that are far more directly business-centric. And so I avoid both challenges by bringing cloud into the picture, not private cloud. And not, but let me, let me be clear, not private cloud on-prem. Because there is an option to do private cloud off-prem, right. Right? right? Where someone else is managing the infrastructure and the core components, but it's dedicated for my use. Right. So it, as long as we just make that distinction there, I think you avoid both problems, which are going to face every single enterprise because of the very reasons that you mentioned. The data issue, IoT, and all of the other myriad of things that are gonna come from all the different doors that IT's never had to deal with in the past. Right. What we're not so subtly um, both hinting at is that both of us over the last six months or a year or even longer have written num numerous times about the fact that if IT organizations, businesses think they're in a position to be ready to scale for what's coming, they are wrong <laughs> in yeah. every single case. They're wrong, they're not ready. They don't have the development team, they don't have the ability to bring the right staff in, they don't have the mindset for building the way they need to build. And few companies that don't have millions of dollars of opportunity on the line at the moment that they're doing it can do that ahead of time. Like the Facebooks, like the Googles, like the Ebays. They, have main, they, they save a percentage, they save 5% on server performance or server utilization or server install time. It's worth having 10 extra guys on the team Figuring out how to make that happen, right? right? It, it that doesn't make sense in the average enterprise, at least not today. Well, I'm sorry to say that the time has come for us to wrap up. Thank you all for uh, trying to uh, get this cloud into a bag here and uh, serve it up for the folks listening. Um, it's been great, uh, and it's been really nice to be here. Um, you know, it, isn't it ironic that we're here with one of the companies that produces the most highly specialized, technical, micro-scale components. You know, I mean, this is real nuts and bolts stuff. And yet, the discussion that they're having, uh, the name of the event, the discussion we're having, is on the highest level of IT. Isn't it amazing that, this, that it's going all the way from literally the chips, and the trans, even the transistors on the chips, to the cloud? So I guess we're going to leave it with that. Thank you guys very much for, uh, for joining us. You can find uh, many, many videos like this one at our YouTube channel, which is youtube.com slash techfieldday, and at uh, techfieldday.com, our website.